Hi, good morning. Good morning, President Guzman. We'll be starting in just one minute. We're just waiting for people to join the, the meeting. I'm going to go ahead and get us started. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this important conversation, which is critical as the global community gathers for the 66th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. I'm Akila Radhakrishnan, the president of the Global Justice Center, a human rights organization using international law to achieve gender equality and dismantle systems of oppression. We combine feminist legal analysis with strategic advocacy to ensure equal protection of the law for women and girls. And it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of our sponsors. I also want to note before I go further that we have simultaneous translation. Um, so please do use the translation options at the bottom of your screen if you want translation into Spanish. Um, and so thank you on behalf of the Global Justice Center. I want to thank Post Feminista, the permanent mission of Mexico to the United Nations, the permanent mission of Ireland to the United Nations, and the National Institute of Women Mexico for co-hosting today's dialogue. This webinar is the second in a series during the U.S. Summit for Democracy Year of Action. The Global Justice Center and Post Feminista are hosting a series of events highlighting the ways in which governments' commitments to advancing the sexual and reproductive health and rights of people all around the world is a key indicator of the strength and health of vibrant democracies that respect the human rights of all people. We're also delighted to support, have the support and co-sponsorship of Ireland and Mexico, as I mentioned today, who are champions on issues of SRHR, women, peace and security, and feminist foreign policies. And in addition, as you're going to hear from our speakers, both countries have also recently made changes in their own domestic context to improve access to abortion. So I have the privilege of introducing our two keynote speakers for today's event, President Nadine Guzman and Ms. Fiona Broderick. So first, President Nadine Guzman is the president of the National Institute of Women, Mexico. She has a professional career, national and international, of more than three decades in the areas of planning, design, and implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of public policies, programs, and projects in the health sector, with an emphasis on sexual and reproductive health, as well as initiatives and policies for gender equality, prevention, and attention to violence against women, and their economic and political empowerment. Previously, President Guzman held positions as the representative of the UN Women in Brazil, representative of the United Nations Population Fund in Guatemala, and director of the Secretary General's campaign Join to End Violence Against Women for Latin America and the Caribbean. Next, we have Ms. Fiona Broderick. Fiona Broderick leads the human rights and gender equality team in the permanent representation of Ireland to the UN. Her previous roles in the Irish Foreign Service include Deputy Director for U.S. Relations, Second Secretary in Ireland's Embassy in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and Third Secretary in the Human Rights Unit of the DFA in Dublin. Prior to joining the Department of Foreign Affairs, Fiona worked in the Homeless Services in Dublin, the Development Sector, and in Youth Work in Ireland and Germany. She holds an LLM in Human Rights Law and Criminal Justice from Queen's University Belfast and a Bachelor of Social Science from University College Dublin. So to get us started, I'm going to ask both President Gussman and Friona to reflect a little bit on the same question, which is what lessons can you share from your country's specific experiences with reforming abortion laws and broadening access to reproductive rights? So President Gussman, I'll have you start us off, please. Thank you. Thank you, Aquila. Um, thank you, everybody. I'll switch to Spanish, so we use the translation. Eh, en nombre del gobierno de México, es realmente un placer iniciar este evento que impulsamos desde nuestras instituciones para establecer compromisos hacia un mejor futuro, poniendo en el centro todos los derechos humanos de las mujeres, incluyendo los derechos sexuales y reproductivos. Quiero saludar con mucho cariño a Aquila Radkirshnan, sorry for the 
Pronunciation, presidente del Centro de Justicia Global, a, a Serra Cipel, directora de promoción global de FOS Feminista, a Brian Flynn, representante permanente adjunto de la misión de Irlanda ante Naciones Unidas, y a Kaiser Buckingham, directora de defensa del Open Society Foundation. Igualmente, quiero agradecer el compromiso de las panelistas, ministras y activistas funcionarios que participan y nos acompañan el día de hoy. En el gobierno de México reconocemos que nuestra democracia se fortalece con la ampliación de derechos y reconocimiento de la autonomía de las mujeres para decidir sobre sus propios cuerpos. Nuestro compromiso es con la salud de todas las mujeres durante toda su vida. Así quiero aprovechar este espacio para decirle que en el Instituto Nacional de las Mujeres una de nuestras obligaciones asumidas está con la justicia reproductiva, que, que haga realidad los principios de atención médica libre, universal y gratuita para toda la diversidad de mujeres. Y trabajamos todos los días para lograrlo. Las mujeres estamos, entramos a la democracia y a las instituciones del Estado tarde y por la fuerza. Hoy, gracias a ello y a las mareas feministas, se está transformando las leyes para abrir nuevos caminos y nuevas formas de pensar y repensar el mundo. Hoy, gracias también a ellas, a los movimientos feministas de mujeres en toda su diversidad, es claro que tomar decisiones en sexualidad y reproducción libres de coerción y violencia es esencial con un enfoque de derechos humanos. Sin embargo, hay que estar atentas al retorno de discursos conservadores que ven con mucho desagrado los logros de las mujeres que están ganando terreno. Ante esto, los estados tenemos el deber de proteger los avances de la agenda de género, sobre todo el ejercicio de los derechos sexuales y reproductivos. Hacerlo implica afianzar lo conquistado, recolocar las voces de las mujeres diversas, buscando la reorganización no patriarcal de las formas de relación entre lo público y lo privado. Y en este marco, el Estado mexicano, especialmente el gobierno del presidente López Obrador, ha demostrado su voluntad de contribuir a la consolidación de los instrumentos internacionales en materias de derechos humanos y población, tales como el Plan de Acción de Cairo, la Plataforma de Acción de Berlín, el Consenso de Montevideo y la Agenda 2030. En noviembre de 2019, en la cumbre de Nairobi, México logró fortalecer a nivel mundial la, la Agenda de Igualdad de Género y Derechos Sexuales y Reproductivos, reconociendo el derecho de las mujeres y las niñas a una vida libre de violencia, así como al ejercicio libre, placentero y responsable de su sexualidad. Como parte de los compromisos asumidos, se estableció una política de población basada en el fomento del desarrollo para cerrar las brechas de desigualdad, especialmente de niñas y mujeres. A más de dos años de la cumbre en México, por primera, México cuenta por primera vez con una coordinación interinstitucional, intersectorial e intergubernamental que incluye a la sociedad civil, para la prevención del embarazo en adolescentes y la eliminación de la violencia sexual contra las niñas. El Instituto Nacional de las Mujeres apuesta estratégicamente por el fortalecimiento de esta estrategia que llamamos CENAPEA a nivel federal, estatal y municipal. Y lo hacemos a, tra a través del Fondo para el bienestar de las mujeres, que desde 2019 que llegamos al gobierno, destina alrededor de 85 millones de pesos al año, más de 4 millones de dólares, a las entidades federativas para dar continuidad a proyectos que contribuyan, entre otras acciones, a ampliar los servicios de salud sexual reproductiva con un enfoque de derechos, redoblar esfuerzos ante las narrativas que buscan socavar los derechos de las mujeres jóvenes y niñas, coadyuvar a la adecuada observancia de la norma 046 para prestar servicios de anticoncepción de emergencia e interrupción legal del embarazo para niñas y adolescentes víctimas de violencia sexual, reconocer la importancia de la educación sexual e integral del acceso a métodos anticonceptivos 
para jóvenes y adolescentes y fomentar el liderazgo juvenil. Así pues, la política integral de bienestar del gobierno de México está comprometida a velar por la garantía de los derechos sexuales y reproductivos de todas las mujeres durante todo su ciclo de vida. Igualmente, hemos apoyado en la medida de nuestras atribuciones los procesos de avance para el acceso de las mujeres al aborto legal y seguro. En septiembre de pasado, la Suprema Corte de Justicia de la Nación eliminó con unas senten sentencias históricas tres de los principales obstáculos que las mujeres mexicanas tenían que enfrentar cuando requerían un servicio de aborto legal y seguro. Primero es que se declara inconstitucional la criminalización del aborto y se pronuncia por primera vez a favor de garantizar el derecho de las mujeres y personas gestantes a decidir sin enfrentar consecuencias penales. La segunda sentencia, en la segunda sentencia se declara inconstitucional que las legislaciones locales reconozcan la vida humana desde la concepción. Y en la tercera sentencia se limita la objeción de conciencia eh, únicamente a circunstancias en las que se ponga en riesgo la vida de la usuaria o se trate de una urgencia médica. Y a estas tres resoluciones, que son un parteaguas para el derecho a decidir de las mujeres, quiero comentarles que desde eh, que llegamos al gobierno, siete entidades federales priorizan la justicia reproductiva sobre estereotipo e ideologías conservadoras, después de que por más de 15 años solo la Ciudad de México tenía eh, la despenalización del aborto. Miren, para seguir avanzando en esta agenda eh, que implica transformar la vida de las niñas y las adolescentes para que sean dueñas de sus vidas, de sus cuerpos, eh, nos falta mucho por trabajar. Por eso quiero cerrar esta intervención haciendo tres llamados muy puntuales a las y los líderes de gobierno. Primero, tenemos que pensar fuera de la caja, hasta encontrar nuevas formas de dotar de contenido a esto que llamamos democracia. Nos corresponde también abrir espacios, crear nuevos mecanismos de diálogo y escucha y entender que existen pluralidad de realidades e historias. Lo segundo es que necesitamos incorporar a esa ágora de lo público las voces que nos faltan. Este mecanismo es fundamental sobre todo en los casos de los pueblos indígenas, de las mujeres indígenas, de las personas afrodescendientes con discapacidad, de los colectivos de LGBTI, etc. Y tercero, requerimos avanzar en un impulso de cam a un cambio cultural para avanzar hacia la igualdad sustantiva entre hombres y mujeres y defender los derechos a la atención de la salud sexual y reproductiva en todos los contextos. Nuevamente, quiero celebrar la realización de este evento paralelo en el marco de la CSW 66, que pondera la voluntad política y el trabajo colaborativo para lograr como estados, pero también como región, que la salud sexual y reproductiva de las mujeres sea una realidad para toda América Latina y el Caribe. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, President Guzman, for your inspiring remarks and, and call to action. Uh, Fiona, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Akila, and thank you, President Guzman, also for your remarks. And also thank you to the whole team at Post Feminista and Global Justice Center uh, for inviting me here today. My colleague, Ambassador Fl Brian Flynn, had hoped to be here, but um, Some of you may have heard that we have experienced a bereavement in our own mission here in the past week. Uh, we lost our deputy uh, permanent representative, Ambassador Jim, Jim Kelly, last week, and it was it was very it was an awful shock to us all. So he's asked me to step in today for this important event, and I'm I'm very grateful for your understanding in that. We're really delighted to co-sponsor such a critical event on the sidelines of CSW, and I'm also looking forward to hearing from the panelists later today. There's a great panel lined up. We're pleased to be here as well with our Mexican colleagues who we work closely with on gender issues here in New York uh, at the Security Council and also beyond. We're particularly keen to be part of this series because it's one that has 
um, national residence for us, as Akita mentioned in her opening remark. The journey towards abortion rights in Ireland was one of the most significant social and political developments in our country in recent memory. Some of you might be familiar. It was a powerful illustration of the symbiotic relationship between democracy and gender equality. For those of you who maybe aren't as familiar with the history of Ireland's reproductive rights legislation, please allow me to give some short background. In the years after our independence in the early 1920s, Irish society and governance was largely influenced by conservative religious values. During those decades, in matters of gender equality, we trailed many of our European partners. And so when we became, when we became a member of the European communities, the, the precursor to the EU in 1973, that acted as a catalyst for many of the changes that subsequently came about. In 1980, following a court challenge to the ban on contraceptives that was in place in Ireland, a new law allowed restricted access. That is, a doctor could prescribe contraception for family planning purposes. At the time, there were some who felt that this could open the door to abortion rights. And so their solution was to propose a constitutional ban on abortion. So that only came in in the early 80s. Following sustained political pressure, in 1983, a large majority voted in favour of what became the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution, which prohibited abortion in almost all circumstances. Thousands of Irish women travelled to the UK for terminations. In 2001, for example, the number is 7,000. In the earlier decades of the 20th century, women who sought abortion services often resorted to doing so in secret, risking their lives and criminal records with unsupervised backdoor abortions. The wording of the 1983 constitutional amendment created a legal quagmire for doctors who were required to protect the life of the baby with due regard to the equal right to life of the mother. While a number of high profile cases drew attention to the unfairness of this law, the untimely death of a woman called Sophita Halapalaver in 2012 illustrated the unsustainability of the legal uncertainty. Ms. Halapalaver died of sepsis, having been denied an abortion on legal grounds during a prolonged miscarriage. And while many activists have protested Ireland's restrictive laws since the, intro since the introduction of the Eighth Amendment, Sabita's death galvanised a much wider cohort in society and many ordinary people who maybe hadn't been engaged previously began to question the place of the law in modern Irish society and they started to demand change. In response to the growing movement, the government convened a Citizens' Assembly to consider the matter and I think this is really pertinent to your discussion today this was, um, these assemblies is something that the Irish government do when, when issues come up that need wider discussion. And so what they do is get a hundred randomly chosen citizens to come together to hear testimonies, particularly from experts, and to deliberate and make recommendations on, on specific issues. So the citizens assembly that was considering abortion law overwhelmingly decided reform was needed suggesting a number of possible options for what they, that could look like in Ireland. Their recommendations were then analysed by a parliamentary committee and the legislature then agreed the text of a referendum question. Our constitution has to be amended only by referendum. The question was simple. It proposed amending the constitution to permit the parliament to regulate the termination of pregnancy. Draft legislation was also published to, to indicate the legislation intended. Several months of rather heavy debate and activism from both sides followed, as you can imagine. But the end result was an overwhelming majority, two thirds saying yes to liberalised abortion law. The entire process from beginning to end is indicative of the role that open and fair democracies have in securing reproductive rights. However, it also illustrates the centrality of sexual and reproductive rights to a functioning democracy. For years, people who needed abortion services in Ireland were either denied access or for those who took the risk or could afford to travel were forced to do so in shame and secret. As research is increasingly showing, gender equality is a prerequisite for functioning democracy and bodily autonomy and sexual reproductive health rights is a fundamental component to achieving gender equality. And I think that was really seen as well through President Gasman's remarks. Ireland's greatest lesson on this matter was the importance of putting fair unbiased information into the hands of the people and creating space for discussion and debate. Through the Citizens' Assembly, public sessions of the Special Parliamentary Committee and the referendum campaign itself, 
voters were encouraged to learn the facts, to hear all arguments, including personal testimonies from those who had had abortions, and to consider models from other countries. It's an example of the importance of collaboration between government and citizens to create meaningful and lasting change. The law underpinning Ireland's abortion services included a provision for a review within three years. That review is currently underway, considering the impact, operation and effectiveness of the legislation. In line with the approach uh, that has been taken all along, this review includes a public consultation. This is how things should be in a functioning democracy. Policymaking is not a perfect art. Legislation requires continuous review and input from those that it is affecting the most. So I'm hoping to continue learning from this experience and sharing lessons with others. And thank you once again for the opportunity to come here today. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you, Akila. Thank you so much, Fiona. And I'm going to turn it over to Bergen, our, our fearless moderator for today's event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Akila. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, President Gosman. Thank you so much, Fiona and President Gosman, for highlighting the symbiotic relationship between gender and democracy and for noting that women and all their diversity throughout the life course must be a part of the democracy. My name is Bergen Cooper. I am the Director of Policy Research with Vos Feminista. I am filling in today as moderator for Kiefer Buckingham from Open Society Foundations. Vos Feminista carries forward the work and partnership of three organizations, the International Planned Parenthood Federation, Western Hemisphere Region, the International Women's Health Coalition, and Change, the Center for Health and Gender Equity. We came together and formed a feminist alliance in June 2020-21 with a vision to advance sexual and reproductive health and rights and justice through an intersectional feminist lens and a commitment to leadership from the Global South. We are an intersectional feminist organization centered around sexual and reproductive health and rights of women, of girls, and of gender diverse people. Together with local partners around the globe, we engage in healthcare, education, and advocacy to advance our agenda. So now that you know who I am, let's get started. A bit of housekeeping. In terms of run of show, we'll hear first hear some brief remarks from each of our panelists, and then we'll have a moderated discussion with them and that includes you. So we will open this conversation up for audience Q&A. If you have a question, please ask the question throughout the panel. You can use the chat box at the bottom of your screen. I'm sorry, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, not the chat box. But if you see it in the chat box, don't worry, I'll look, I'll see it. Um, and we will be monitoring your questions throughout the presentation. If you are targeting your question at a specific panelist, please note that or free, feel free to uh, question all the panelists. So now that that's out of the way, let's move on to our exciting panelists. I will introduce each speaker and then we will start our discussion. Melissa Bretti is the chair of the UN Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls. A human rights lawyer from Nepal, she has spent over two decades advocating for women's rights through the use of national, regional, and international law and mechanisms. She has led fact-finding missions, undertaken strategic litigation, built the capacity of civil society organizations, and provided technical support for law reform to governments in Asia. Her current work is global in scope and sits at the intersection of gender, label, labor, and macroeconomic policy, gender-based violence, and sexual and reproductive rights. Ms. Upredi is a fellow at the University of Toronto Law's Faculty International Reproductive and Sexual Health Law Program and is currently Senior Director of Program and Global Advocacy at the Center for Women's Global Leadership at Rutgers University in the United States. Welcome, Melissa. Nolene Nabulavu is a feminist community organizer, analyst, educator, and activist who has been working for socioeconomic, ecological, and climate justice and universal human rights in urban and formal settlements, rural and maritime Fiji, the Pacific, and globally for over 35 years. Guided by an autonomous feminist movements, Nolene works with communities, governments, development sector, and the UN to advance bold heterodox strategies on urgent complex questions of human rights and development justice. She is executive director of Diverse Voices of Action, DIVA for Equality, and holds many social movement roles. 
In 2020, Nolene was the recipient of the International Women's Health Coalition Joan B. Dunlop Award for Advocacy. Welcome, Nolene. Mm -hmm. um, Andres Constantine is an associate with the Health and Human <laughs> Rights Initiative and the Assistant Director of Health Law Programs at the O'Neill Institute. Additionally, he is an adjunct professor of law at Georgetown University. He works on legal and policy issues related to health and specializes on sexual and reproductive health and rights on the regulation of non-communicable disease risk factors. In addition to his work at the O'Neill Institute, Andres is pursuing his Doctor of Judicial Science degree at Georgetown Law, and he is a 2020-21 Aspen Institute New Voices Senior Fellow. Welcome, Andy. Jade Mina is the Executive Director of Trust for Indigenous Culture and Health, TICA. She's been working on women's rights, especially reproductive health and rights, for over 14 years. In 2007, Jane joined TICA as the Sexuality Program Officer. Her work has included developing programs, fun sexuality education materials, training on reproductive health choices, and advocating for changes in attitudes, laws and policies, and creating safe spaces for honest conversations about sex and sexuality. Previously, Jade worked with Women in Law and Development in Africa, championing for the enactment and implementation of the Sexual Offense Act 2006. Welcome, Jade. Today's conversation brings together many overlapping themes, strengthening democracy, advancing human rights, protecting the environment and addressing climate crisis, defending reproductive rights, and countering authoritarianism. We know that these challenges often have disparate impact on certain populations, women and girls, indigenous groups, LGBTQI populations, and these people are often left out of critical conversations, their voices absent from the table. After hosting its first summit for democracy last December, the United States and other participating governments are now engaging in a year of action before the second summit in December, 2022. The first summit focused on three pillars, defending against authoritarianism, addressing and fighting corruption, and promoting respect for human rights. So now let me turn to our panelists. With CSW's theme this year on achieving gender equality in the context of climate change, to you, how are sexual and reproductive health and rights connected to these pillars and to climate change? And why are they essential to democracy? Melissa, I'll start with you. Thank you very much, Bergen, for that introduction. Um, and first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me as chair of the Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls to participate in this event. The Working Group is a special procedure established by the Human Rights Council and an independent UN Women's Human Rights Mechanism. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Mexico at today's event as they are our lead sponsor, and we are very grateful for their continued support. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of Ireland as they are such a great champion for gender equality. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here today with all the distinguished panelists to exchange some thoughts on current challenges and opportunities concerning women's bodily autonomy. Since the struggle for bodily autonomy is at the heart of the deep connections between authoritarianism, lack of accountability, and accountability is what you need to fight against corruption, and to promote respect for human rights, which is really the antidote for, for both. Since the working group's inception in 2010, we've closely examined the persistence of structural discrimination in four interrelated areas of women's lives in our thematic reports and country visits, uh, which focus on the areas of political and public life, economic and social life, family and culture, and health and safety. Our more recent reports have focused on reasserting gender equality and countering rollbacks, including those led by conservative forces within the UN system, uh, women deprived of liberty and women's human rights in the changing world of work. Now, while each report has a specific thematic focus, all of them reveal deep connections between the denial of sexual and reproductive rights and the absence of legal protections for these rights which consequently deny women full autonomy and their, the ability to participate fully and as equals in all spheres of life. 
We also see how the denial of these rights and lack of legal protections create specific burdens and disadvantages that result in the oppression, marginalization, and exclusion of women and girls, effectively creating a vicious cycle of discrimination, oppression, and exclusion. Our latest thematic report to the Human Rights Council examines women's and girls' sexual and reproductive health rights in crisis. In this report, we stress that key factors undermining their sexual and reproductive health and autonomy in situations of crisis are underpinned and exacerbated by pre-existing systemic disadvantage and discrimination that they face throughout their lives. The multiple factors that underlie and exacerbate the risks and threats to women's and girls' sexual and reproductive health rights include, among others, um, discriminatory laws, policies, and practices, failure by states to prioritize and invest in sexual and reproductive health services, lack of legal accountability, exclusion of women and girls from decision-making processes, ideological and religious opposition to sexual and reproductive health rights. We emphasize that action is needed in all these areas to advance and protect women's and girls' sexual and reproductive rights. It's also important to remember from the point of view of equal participation in the democracy, that as, and as we highlight in our report, the compounded barriers and threats to multiple uh, due to multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination faced by certain groups of women and girls, such as, for example, those living with disabilities, residing in rural areas, migrant, refugee, and internally displaced women and girls, among others. We note that there are groups of women and girls who have been living in what we describe as a persistent state of crisis as a consequence of a history of oppression, exclusion, and discrimination, as well as systematic violence and disregard for their culture and traditions. Women's and girls' enjoyment of their sexual and reproductive rights is not only crucial for their survival and well-being, but it is indeed, and this is, has been noted by previous panelists, an essential precondition for their participation in political and public life, and I would say as well as in the world of work, and to be free from gender-based violence. The harms that women and girls may face in relation to their sexual and reproductive health must not be treated as unavoidable tragedies, but recognized as the outcomes of systemic oppression linked to policy failures, the absence of legal protection, and systems that are designed to create disadvantage and produce exclusion based on sex and gender. This translates into less voice and power for women and girls and is inherently anti-democratic. I'd like to end by noting that, and just emphasizing since this is the theme of uh, CSW this year, that this is true even in the context of climate change where women's voices are not being adequately heard in relation to the gendered impact of climate change. Some of the consequences are yet to be addressed, such as those linked to the toxification of the planet, which is proven to have links to infertility, a higher risk of miscarriages and reproductive cancers. Some women will pay with their lives as a result of this neglect. So at the end of the day, discrimination against women and girls cannot be achieved without the political will of states and their willingness to listen. And while it is obligatory for them to prioritize this, they have been slow. This is exactly why all barriers to women's participation in democratic processes must be removed and their freedom must be preserved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. And now I would like to move on to Nolene. Nolene, I'd like to ask you the same question. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, um, and really great to be here with all these wonderful um, feminists, governments, um, civil society friends. Um, so I'd first um, start just by proposing that um, democracy without universal human rights and social, economic, ecological, and climate justice is what is the empty promise um, as yet unfulfilled. And for feminists like myself, um, democratization, if it is about um, principles of equity really begins and ends at the granular um, with bodily autonomy and integrity of the single body and our ability to access human rights, including sexual uh, and reproductive health and rights, and also rights related to sexual orientation, gender identity and expression and sex characteristics, as much as it is about the meso and macro ending all of the oppressive structures and processes and building those just um, development alternatives. Um, so this is not to say that the collectivities don't matter, of course they do, but the issue of the choice to act, to enter and to exit places and with people, to negotiate and to navigate 
um, all kinds of collectivities, from intimate partnerships to families to workplaces, through to all of the work and state institutions, and then the ability also to demand justice within and between countries, um, and the impacts of things like white supremacy, neoliberal extractive capitalism, coloniality, and imperialism that is still happening today um, is the central challenge um, for all individuals, I think, and especially women, children, gender non-binary people, LGBTQI people, indigenous people, Afro-descendant people of color, those in the majority South, including the South in the North, um, those of us who are in climate frontline uh, communities in coastal Delta areas, but also um, in, in glacier areas in Nepal and many others. Um, informal settlements, um, those outside kind of capital areas, um, those in maritime and remote areas. And I think it's important to talk about all of these intersectionalities. If your sexual orientation is criminalized, or if your gender identity and your, your expression is stigmatized within your community, if your sex characteristics are medicalized, um, then it's hardly a possibility to be a fully participating member of the nation state and your own society. Um, but we can also argue, I would say, that the two in three women in the Pacific that are experiencing gender-based violence amongst the highest per capita rates anywhere cannot themselves be said to be fully experiencing democracy and justice. And then if your country is under threat from COVID-19, uh, climate change and ecological loss and damage, um, and so much pushback against even saying the term loss and damage, um, debt injustice, vaccine injustice, um, war, corruption of financial flows, both at the sender and at the receiver levels, um, the militarization, authoritarian rule, ethno-nationalism, then you also can't be a fully participating member of the nation state and society. So when we speak of the nation state and democracy, we're often not talking about everyone in the universal we actually, but it's actually those who hold privilege and power or who coercively conform uh, to norms, those who have to be rendered acceptable and visible in data, in analysis, in text, and in person. Um, so we have one of the most progressive constitutions on SOGISEC in the world in Fiji, and yet there's very, very little drawdown into law and policy on recognition of gender identity and identity documents. We can't have adoption by same-sex couples. Um, there's many, many ways that, that those like me can't fully participate in society and in state processes. So some gains have been made, but, but nowhere near enough in many places where we're still uh, criminalized. So one set of work we have to do is to place SRHR firmly in the core of several you know, paradigm shifts. First, we're trying to move the entire locus of development to a center of care, social provisioning and well-being. So any failure to do this is what's brought us to the social, economic, ecological and climate emergency in which we find ourselves. This begins and ends with individual people, with single bodies. It manifests through biological and created family relations. Um, wider collectivities and all kinds of groups and interest communities. So we've been working from that premise for 10 years at Diva for Equality and in social movements that then are, you know, with us in concentric circles from the local to the global and back. Um, for an understanding of what it is to be an intersectional human being at the heart of um, of democratization. The second thing is that we have to, we often state in feminist work that we're working for justice and liberation on all territories. Um, okay, then that has to mean individual bodies in partner relationships. It must be about um, faith-based groups. It has to be about state and non-state service institutions, development agencies, the UN. Um, and it's about all of our economic and ecological territories um, the, and, and whether there is care and social provisioning um, at work in there. And that leads to my third point, my last point, which is on the issue of care. We, we talk about those five R's, you know, we say we recognize, we reduce, we redistribute, we reward, and we ensure representation on unpaid care and domestic work. And in the Pacific, we're very much also using the term communal work now, because there's so much communal work that is done um, within our communities and, and societies by women. And, and, and 
we have three national studies and a synthesis report that show women doing over three times the amount of unpaid care domestic and communal work in rural Fiji, for instance. So you can't be participating fully in society when you're absolutely exhausted. You're the first up, the last to bed, and when the state and society, while built on your labor, is not designed for your benefit. In fact, it often works actively against it via um, patriarchal based laws and policies and practice. So if we're really to, to strengthen gender just and SRHR informed democratization, then we have to see a massive transformation. And what we talk about is really a, a reconfiguration of the nation state, right? It's a massive transformation. And we're talking a lot at the moment about feminist foreign policy, but I'd love to see us speak more about feminist domestic policy, the recuperation of a gender just and feminist development state. That means better data, better research. Um, it means, uh, sorry, I'm getting, I'm trying to move fast. Um, cross ministerial national action plans um, on the barriers to gender justice and human rights, including prevention and treatment of um, of sexual re reproductive health and rights issues, but also elimination of violence against women and girls, social floor, social protection, um, and social infrastructure um, on health, including SRHR and gynecological cancers. We have, you know, nine out of 10 women um, with gynecological cancers um, are in the economic South. So that's, a, that's an absolute justice issue. Um, and that's an issue of democratization as well. Um, we need adequate housing and shelter, SGBV prevention and response, and, and on sexual orientation, gender identity and expression. It is about feminist foreign policy, and that means that it's also about challenges to extractivism and fossil fuel and, and the impacts on our bodies, on individual bodies, calling out any weak extraterritorial climate and environmental policy. So I think for many feminists like me, the premise of this session is a given and it's a wonderful set of work to move forward and speak about more. No articulation of justice or democracy is real without access to an experience of bodily autonomy, integrity and all human rights. So I think I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Nolene. Yeah, the premise is a given. You are absolutely right. And thank you for highlighting feminist domestic policy and really talking about operationalizing constitutions that, that the words on paper are certainly not enough. Uh, thank you so much. And Jade, I'd like to turn it over to you now with the same question. Thank you, Bergen. Um, I will just uh, highlight and from where the other colleagues have spoken and try and shine a light on the linkages and intersectionalities um, we see between sexual and productive health and rights um, with um, democracy, with um, corruption and with climate change. I'd just like to first of all say that sexual and productive health and rights is essential to democracy because democracy thrives only when people are feeling equal and when they feel worthy and, and worthy of dignity. Individuals with inadequate healthcare, for example, are not able to participate in democratic processes because they are simply just trying to access the fundamental needs that they lack. Democratic processes also play a role to ensure that laws and policies reflect the needs of communities and democratic processes and allow for people to be able to voice their needs and that these are reflected in laws. Corruptions on the other hand and illicit financial flows robs countries of funds that are necessary to make SRHR a reality. I live in a country, for example, whose health budget is at 3% and relies heavily on donor funds to fund SRH. Therefore, sometimes um, things like the global gag rule completely affects the women's lives and contribute to a large number of maternal debts. Um, we also realize that if we fight corruption, then maybe we would be able to truly receive the sexual and productive health and services to the highest attainable standard as promised in our constitution. Also, I'd like to just say that SRH is also closely linked to, the, to our environment we live in and issues of climate change disproportionately affect women, especially because women exist in social economic inequalities and sometimes cultural norms that push them and relegate them to, um, to be dis disempowered and sometimes uh, 
not able to access many services and rights. During periods of droughts, for example, in communities, it's often the women and the girls who have to walk longer distances to either collect food, water, or firewood, often putting them in a greater risk of attack and danger of violence. Climate change also pushes communities relying on farming further into food insecurity and poverty, which in turn drives um, many practices that are unfair and in unequal. For example, female genital mutilation, early child and forced marriage, especially in communities that use bright price as a way of um, family wealth. Um, it also increases gender-based violence and increases high risk of sexual behaviors like transactional sex. Competition for scarce resources um, always or most often leads to displacement and often leads to conflict. Um, in terms of conflict, it's women and children who are most affected. Therefore, we see that climate change included, includes or leads to displacement, which hinders access to basic healthcare services, such as emergency contraception, post-exposure prophylaxis, um, HIV treatment or STA treatment, uh, psychosocial support or uh, cases of support for gender-based violence. Groups that already struggle to access appropriate healthcare services, for example, people with disabilities, LGBTI community and indigenous women and children only have this situation worsened during times of climate, disasters and displacements. I'd like to end there for this particular question. Thank you so much, Jade. And, and thank you again for bringing up the global gag rule and the way it infringes on de the democratic process and national sovereignty. And thank you to the research that Tika has produced on the GGR. Uh, it's an extremely uh, important contribution to the research field. Uh, Andres, I'd like to move on to you, Andy, for the same question. The floor is yours. Yes, yeah. Thank you very much for, for having me. I'm very, very happy to join this important conversation with such esteemed colleagues. Uh, so to answer your, your question, Bergen, I'd like to, to stress and draw your attention to uh, the attention to the recognition, protection, and commitment uh, to sexual and reproductive health rights, uh, especially in recent years, and how it has been indicative of uh, strong and robust democracies. It has been indicative of, of societies that were ready to have those debates and where the voice of the people uh, has been heard, right? Uh, so if we look, for instance, at Latin America, it has been very, very clear in, in the context of abortion decriminalization, where we have seen extremely democratic and deliberative uh, processes. I guess that by now, uh, most of us uh, have seen all the pictures and videos of people taking on the streets uh, in Argentina, Mexico, or Colombia. Uh, and this is, of course, the result of years and years of work uh, of civil society organizations and local leaders to destigmatize the issue of abortion and, and eliminate taboos related to sexual and reproductive health, particularly in, in, in a very, very conservative uh, region like Latin America, right? So what, what happened, uh, and, and I think uh, it's still happening uh, in Latin America, particularly with the green wave, um, shows how important and crucial these social processes of deliberation are in reinforcing and strengthening uh, democracies. It was not just uh, public demonstrations or taking on the streets. It was also how the, the issue of abortion, for instance, in this case, was discussed in, in daily life, right? It, it was discussed in bars, in classrooms, in the bus, in Congress. Uh, the entire society debated, the entire society learned, uh, and the entire society came out from the debate stronger. So I think it is becoming increasingly clear that um, discussion and deliberation around sexual and reproductive health and rights climate change and the commitment to, to gender equality can only strengthen and lead to more uh, mature democracies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. And you're right, this is a conversation for the entire society, as you said, in bars and classrooms and on the bus. That's, that's, that's fantastic. And as you mentioned, when we see the images of the green wave, we need to remember the years and years of work that, that went into making those uh, extraordinary displays and, and wonderful movements. Thank you all. So now I would like to move our conversation into some specific questions for each of our panelists. Let me remind everyone uh, in the audience that after this, I'm going to turn to you for questions. So please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and share questions uh, throughout the presentation. 
So Melissa, I'm gonna turn back to you now. You, you spoke about this a little bit earlier, but your office published a report in 2018 on reasserting equality and countering rollbacks. Can you speak a bit more about the trends you're seeing in your work, uh, in particular, these rollbacks and rising authoritarianism and its relationship to sexual and reproductive health and rights? Thank you for the question, Bergen. And yes, indeed, in our 2000 report, we did document, uh, we acknowledge many of the gains that have been made over decades of advocacy and struggle by women's rights activists and feminists. Um, and we also, in this report, draw attention to the remaining gaps and the obstacles that exist to achieve gender equality, particularly due to the rise of movements opposing the universality of women's human rights which also seek to fragment and weaken the human rights system. Uh, we do acknowledge that rising authoritarianism and political governance combined with uncontrolled greed for profit, the continued exploitation of women's labor, a number of things that Norlene mentioned earlier, um, including the lack of access to universal, uh, lack of universal access to all types of healthcare, economic crises that disproportionately impact women and girls, as well as the politicization of religion and increasing disenfranchisement of populations that are most impacted by structural discrimination. All of these have posed considerable challenges. So, you know, we do know that this unprecedented pushback has been progressing across regions by an alliance of conservative political ideologies and religious fundamentalism. And what's really troubling is that in a number of cases, they have infiltrated key institutions that we once looked up to for the protection of our rights. And we've identified also that there are many obstacles to gender equality that women and girls face throughout their life cycle. And we clearly recognize, because this is an undeniable reality that the discrimination that they face in the family and in, in relation to their sexual and reproductive rights, specifically in relation to abortion and their bodily autonomy, really does remain one of the most significant challenges. Um, there is a global, uh, a persistent global discriminatory cultural construction of gender that is often tied to the misuse of and propelled by the misuse of religion and the continued reliance of states on cultural justifications for discriminatory laws and practices that, that blatantly fail to respect human rights standards. So these are some of the things that we have acknowledged. And we do note that diverse religious fundamentalists often work together tactically at the international level, maybe sometimes more often than movements do, to really thwart advances in women's human rights. Um, and there are also member states that are complicit and closely aligned with these actors, which is incredibly troubling. But one thing that I'll say before I end my point is that it really is important to remember that there are a greater number of states that continue to put their support behind gender equality and women's and girls' sexual and reproductive rights. And we must not lose sight of this fact. Like feminist movements have in the past and continue to play a key role in sounding the alarm and presenting a transformative vision for change in spite of being inadequately resourced. Many are using human, the human rights framework and engaging with independent mechanisms, including the working group, as well as many other special procedures and treaty bond, bodies and other entities. And we as a mechanism continue to use our voice to highlight the challenges faced by individuals as well as feminist movements, especially in relation to them being under-resourced and not supported by their own governments. And this has been a common thread um, in our work and in our reports. And in fact, our next report will focus on girls and young women's right to participation in political and public life through activism, because this is also something that is an incredibly important part of this whole discussion. And in fact, during the many consultations that were held for this report, one thing that I heard a number of young activists say was that it was their personal experience of discrimination in the family, the, the opposition to bodily autonomy and denial of access to sexual and reproductive health services and even information, as well as their exclusion from formal processes in the policy arena on issues that concern them, including, for instance, climate change, as well as peace and security that really motivated them to become activists. So what we as a mandate take away from this and what I'd like the audience to take away from this is that while we continue to see rollbacks and regression, particularly of our sexual and reproductive rights, we are also seeing new activists and movements emerge, which is indeed promising. And this is the energy that we have to harness and leverage and build new alliances with. So back to you, Bergen. Melissa, thank you so much. I am really excited about that new report. Um, it's it's so exciting to 
to hear about new activists and, and um, to, to understand a bit more about how that discrimination in the family is the, is the first place that is a harm, but also an inspiration into the public sphere. Uh, thank you so much. Nolene, I'm gonna move on to you. So climate change impacts all populations, but some populations are disproportionately impacted. And this can include, but isn't limited to, women and girls and gender diverse people and LGBTQI people. Can you tell us about the linkages between climate change and SRHR and the steps governments must take to protect the health and rights of all people? Thanks a lot. And I'm excited about that report as well. So I'll be looking out eagerly. Um, sex and reproductive health and rights, we all know, is central to any development response and to democratization and justice, because the body is where the damage and the trauma and the human rights violations are felt. Um, and, and bodies are also the vehicle that we use to move through every day. And, I, I, and I, I'm saying that because I think sometimes we forget about the fact that all of these are being experienced in the one body. Um, so, you know, any SRHR response has to be framed through a lens of gender equality and human rights. Um, we, if we can't be active in all areas of our lives, if in some areas of our lives we are violated on a daily basis or we're kept out of so many different um, decision making spaces, um, then it's very, very hard to experience democracy. And we have to keep saying that over and over. And um, women in the Pacific have some of the highest levels globally of unmet contraceptive need. And there's a reason for that. And we haven't yet managed to convince um, highly hierarchical and patriarchal communities and then, you know, formed into nation state, hardened into nation states that, you know, that all of the community is affected when SRHR is not res respected. Um, that it's a priority as high, for example, in our region, we have NCDs, uh, non-communicable diseases as a, as a regional emergency. And many of us have been making the point that that should also be um, about unmet SRHR need and about um, sexual and gender-based violence in our region. You know, so what priorities put on both national, regional, and then global um, initiatives? Because the consequences are immense and they're multi-sectoral. Um, when women and girls and LGBTQI people, people with disabilities, sex workers and others are confronted with many, many issues like um, cyclones, flooding, um, as well as lockdown realities from COVID, um, all of the loss and damage that our communities and ourselves are facing every day, like flooding, water salinity, um, intrusion of, of, um, of water into landmass, damage to food and water systems, lack of housing. Um, we've had, you know, around 50% of our population that are underemployed or unemployed right now because we had to have that lockdown around COVID-19 for, for months and then a, over a year on end. Um, and what that does to us physically, but also, you know, all the regressions that we're seeing in terms of our, our you know, 20 years of progression on many of these issues on poverty and, and health and malnutrition and, um, and the health of, of mothers and, and children is we're really seeing the regression now. Um, but there's also the issues around psychosocial care and medical services. Um, and then when you add that, we've, we've got a 200% increase in um, gender-based violence just in the last quarter um, that we've seen. And this is in a country where the rates are already 70% per capita for all women, 84% per capita violence against LBT women um, that we have in Fiji. So in this situation, while you can clearly outline the linkages between SRHR um, and, and climate change and development and democratization, the state is often slow to respond in methodical ways. Because what, hap what happens is um, they start to subsume SRHR under health, try to deal with it, but it's in really siloed and ad hoc ways because the state, especially if it's a small island state, for instance, um, but you know every state has its particularities, um, that the way that they respond is not in a coherent, you know, systematic way. 
Um, and, and then we end up not tackling realities around um, SGBV, sexual abuse of minor, uh, minors, but also things like menstrual health, things like emergency contraception. We weren't even able to move freely around the state because of COVID-19. So we were having to come up with specific strategies that were around intra um, borders, um, borders even just within the state, not even talking about our, you know, our external borders. Um, and, and so the last thing I would just say is, um, sorry, I'm just moving up a little now. I really like to say that, for instance, you have to, we have to think both as, um, you know, when we're talking about these issues now, in a single month in Fiji in January, for instance, we had intense rain for three of the four weeks, right? So that's flooding over and over. Then there's a cyclone that we had with a direct hit, two more that came past us, which then bring additional flooding. Um, we have damaged household goods from people who already have so little in their homes, enough to bring um, uh, you know, over and over the cleanups, then you have damaged household goods, you have physical danger from waterlogged um, electrical goods, then there's the volcanic eruption that we had at the same time in January in Tonga, with the sonic booms and the psychological distress to a whole population in, you know, in Tonga, for instance, and also us in, in the rest of the Pacific. Health concerns, we have internal displacements, food and water sovereignty issues, and much more. And I say that because we now also have then the health related impacts like a thousand cases of leptospirosis there's dengue there's waterborne diseases flu is rising so people often are able to say okay climate change has an issue you know has is is a part of the story of people of the pacific but they don't realize how much the loss and damage is impacting on every single set of work that we do on every single aspect of our lives including sexual and reproductive health and rights and 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 um and gender justice um and i and i think i just say for instance that when we come up with those responses to that the system you know you ask the question around government so for instance um one of the things that we're seeing a lot is um the 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 fiji government have now instituted free sanitary pads for all menstruating students in junior junior and high school and that's great this is an important pro poor policy it situates the issue as a social imperative so it is part of helping for a systems change but but what we're trying to encourage them to do is to say, this is also about issues of water and sanitation. It is also about issues of poverty overall. There are economic imperatives that we require in order to look at those deeper issues and not just at um, menstrual health, um, because that is something that is a, you know, a low hanging fruit that we can deal with in our community um, with maybe less um, chance of pushback than um, abortion rights, for instance. So it's about trying to make sure that we're doing this in a more coherent, consistent um, um, policy stream within our communities. I think I'll end on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nolene. And you said we have to keep saying it, so I will repeat it, that if we are kept out of spaces, we don't experience democracy. Uh, and, and thank you for for really highlighting the silos within governments and, and how these issues are can become siloed, but climate change is not siloed. It is impacted, it, it has impact on every single aspect of life as you highlighted. Thank you so much. Uh, Jade, I'd like to move on to you. So we know that colonialism and environmental degradation can be hindrances to the fulfillment of sexual and reproductive health and rights. Can you tell us a little bit about how indigenous knowledge and culture can create safe spaces for the advancement of SRHR and climate justice? Thank you. Um, I remember you just said earlier that um, climate change affects people disproportionately. And I think indigenous people are among us, those who are marginalized and therefore always being affected more disproportionately than others um, when it comes to climate change. And yet, um, even when they have knowledge on how to live sustainably, this knowledge is not taken into account and it's they're not at the decision making tables. And therefore, their knowledge that they have is not, being con is not contributing to the change. Um, that we should be seeing. I think there is need to interrogate the importance of indigenous knowledge, and this will transform the idea of democracy and practice of power to include local communities, especially 
on sustainable approaches to manage land, water, and biodiversity. There are positive indigenous practices and knowledge still being maintained by many ethnic communities across Kenya and across the world. The loss of this indigenous knowledge and culture affects the resilience of indigenous groups and pushes them further into social exclusion and denies the nation and the world as, as at large of the wisdom and knowledge still held by elders in many communities. It also represents a missed opportunity to better respond to climate crisis in terms of farming methods. Currently, modern farming methods are unsustainable. We know that greenhouse emissions contribute to 60% of biodiversity loss in degradation of natural resources like soil and water. Indigenous people due to high to illiteracy or poverty levels, they lack the empowerment to lose and also lose the indigenous knowledge to encroaching urbanization. Strengthening indigenous knowledge systems would lead to protecting the initiatives and help control the surge of uncontrolled subdivision of land and also unsustainable ways of farming or coexistent with nature. Um, SRH also is an aspect that can cannot be realized in the absence in the absence of other fundamental rights. For them to be feasible, there needs to be equitable or adequate living standards, right to food, housing, water, clothing, and participation in cultural life. We do know that culture plays a role in influencing how we dress, how who we have sex with, when we get married how we organize for justice, how we take care of our bodies, how we talk about change, how we express ourselves, and how we care for our environment. Culture is at the heart of every community and contributes to identity, social cohesion, and prosperity. However, most of the time when we look at culture, uh, and especially like traditional culture, we look at it from the time, from its shortcomings, as a and not at, as what it can contribute positively. We should approach working with and through culture from valuing what is positive, amplifying it, and working with communities so that we can build health and well being while supporting communities to clarify what they need to change and become more resilient, just, and inclusive. We do know that um, in most communities, yes, there are things that need to change in the way that culture has evolved, but this does not mean that it is all negative and this is the lens that we should look at it from. Um, most cultures bring a lot of positivity and this should be celebrated. And when this happens, we can really truly um, achieve the transformative power of culture by working from the ground up instead of bottom, uh, from instead of top-down approaches which have not been sustainable in the past. By helping communities to culturally localize processes of transformative change, we can contribute to decolonizing the discourse of, and practice of development. It is important to come up with equity-based policies and programs to ensure that those who receive disproportionate impact from occurrences such as climate change remain included and are sitting at the decision-making tables. Jade, thank you so much. You're you're right. Culture culture is not a shortcoming, and I, I really appreciate what you said about when we when we think of it that way that we are denying the world at large the wisdom of elders. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for highlighting this, Andy. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to you. Uh, can you please elaborate on your work on uh, on your work on research and uh, in numerous jurisdictions on the way that conscious based refusals to reproductive health care challenge democracy. Yes, so uh, I've been working on this issue for the last uh, six years. And what I have seen is the increasing reliance on rights of conscience and the use of conscientious objection in particular, not simply as an exemption uh, from the performance of legally mandatory obligations, but as a way to abstract and prevent the enjoyment of legally protected civil rights. So just as the recognition and commitment to sexual and reproductive uh, rights and health uh, are indicative of healthy and vibrant democracies, the emergence of forces against uh, these rights uh, also shows the fragility to which democracies are subject to. 
So when used to counter uh, progress uh, in the recognition of sexual and reproductive rights, conscientious objection really brings about uh, legitimacy concerns as the social consequences of its exercise uh, are less beneficial than those decided by democratic processes, right? In that context, um, conscientious objection may be considered an illegitimate intervention over democratic decisions. It's, in other words, it's, it constitutes a, a form of veto uh, that certain groups or conservative or religious actors uh, are using over decision, uh, decisions taken by democratically legitimized bodies. And these religious uh, groups, uh, from my research, uh, have become more aggressive in their claims. Uh, religious freedom and freedom of conscience uh, is no longer defined as a demand to live according to one's uh, own belief, but it's being used as a tool to change the social order when the progress of majority democratic consensus is contrary uh, to their own beliefs, right? So what I have found, particularly from examining the conduct of these groups and, and legal developments around conscience-based claims in, in recent years across different countries, uh, is that, interestingly, um, these new uses of conscience-based claims uh, that we see today represent a substantial departure for, from uh, the original purpose of conscientious objection. This is a use that is not circumscribed to the internal sphere, but goes beyond it, right? Uh, these uses are increasingly being used as mechanisms to achieve legal, a legal modification of a general nature or to abstract, as I said before, uh, democratically adopted norms. So when we talk about uh, the appeal to conscientious objection uh, to sexual and reproductive health care in recent years, uh, it has become more than just a mere call for authorities to leave them alone. Uh, instead, it signals an intention to manipulate another person's normative situation intentionally. Uh, and when individuals or, or groups of individuals in certain countries use conscience-based claims in this manner, freedom of conscience uh, or religious freedom disguises or, or represents uh, an excuse for uh, political subversion. What is interesting is that despite the fact that efforts to make progress in the sexual and reproductive health arena indicate strong and robust uh, democracies, the risk of rollback and backlash, as, as Melissa mentioned, uh, will still be there as long as governments uh, continue to kind of pretend that the political use of conscience-based claims, these new uses of conscience-based claims, is merely a reflection of the rules of, of the game, right? That is, that is something that you need to give to a certain group to kind of balance the equation when passing or adopting laws that uh, protect uh, sexual and reproductive rights. Um, to a certain extent, and, and since we're talking also about climate change, it's like passing a law that says you can't pollute the river while at the same time including an article in that law that says, uh, but you can be exempted if it affects your business. Of course, it will affect the business of uh, fossil fuel companies or uh, many polluting companies, but allowing that exemption renders the law futile, right? So what we need is uh, for governments to, to recognize that these new uses of conscience-based claims are undemocratic, in nature and should have no place if uh, governments are taking efforts to fully realize uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, seriously. Thank you. Andy, thank you. That is fascinating. So these conscious-based refusals, as you said, are a form of veto. Um, that they aren't the they aren't playing the rules of the game. This is it's it's really it's it's really fascinating and worrisome as you mentioned about how they are becoming more aggressive in their claims. Uh, and, and I think the climate change analysis analogy was just perfect. Thank you, everyone. So now we are moving on to a new exciting part of our discussion, which is questions from the audience. Thank you from, for everyone who's been sharing questions in the Q&A box, please continue to do so. Uh, and I will turn to the questions now. So our first questions, and this can be open to any panelist who would like to answer, is how to abolish the patriarchal ideology of usos y costumbres or ways and traditions that prevent girls and adolescents of indigenous societies to become mothers as the mean of their life. Of course, those societies want to preserve their way of life, but girls and adolescents cannot be used as a strategy to preserve an oppressive system through early marriages and early pregnancies and early motherhood. It has to be stopped if we fight for real democracy. Would anybody like to respond to this? I'll say a couple of things if that's okay. I, I'd, I'd say first um, for me, it's about, 
you know, when we started 10 years ago, one of the first things that we tried to do was to make sure that we were very clear politically ourselves inside our own group or institution on what our politics is and how we move from that set of politics. And, and I think once you do that, then it's very easy for you to build over time a collective sense of understanding. And, I, and I'm not saying that just as you know a, a feminist collective that is a civil society organization, I think that can be done at an institutional level as well, is be very clear on your red lines and on, on the way in which you move. And then that is also around systems of meaning you know being clear that we're talking about things like semiotics that we're talking about the making of meaning and not being afraid of that because if we if we continually just say um you know okay this is this is the way we've done this for thousands of years and we're never going to you know to, to do anything different um then then it really does stay like that but if you're if you're used to being able to talk about how meanings are formed how we maintain them how we negotiate them how they're systematized how they become resisted or you know how you become part of those systems of meaning um and how you do the work of change and 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 renorming then it becomes part of your political practice no matter who you are whether you're in governments or you're in non-government um, sectors and and I just wanted to give one example so we've we've been building some bridges you know we're doing some work on on social infrastructure and physical infrastructure as well as part of our work um, on on gender justice um, and so we were building a, a bridge with the local community and part of what we had to negotiate was the fact that we had gender non-binary builders who were in the community building for a couple of weeks at a time. And so that set of work that we had to do was about negotiating around whether or not they could wear shorts in the village, because generally in a village, you know, young women are not encouraged to, to, to wear shorts. Through the negotiation with the elders, not only were they able to do that and to talk about issues of safety in the workplace and, and many of those issues, but also to talk about issues of gender identity and expression. Um, and, and then we had more young women who were able to work in that set of work and they ended up helping build the bridge. And, and, and it, is a, it is a kind of, to me, a really concrete example of why we shouldn't stop ourselves from doing the work of, of value change and of norm change, because these possibilities occur. It's whether we already have a cultural practice ourselves of, as Jade, Jade said, to, to not do it from a place of discomfort and, you know, and fear and anger, but to really work with others on how you move forward in terms of, um, of, of um, uh, not just empowerment, but women's human rights and, and social justice for all. Um, and that's very clear. We are never, we are never compromising in that, in that set of political narrative. So if, if a government, for instance, won't work with us because of that, then we step back and someone else can move into that space. And then sometimes later, the work comes in again. So it's found us now as, as a technical advisor, for instance, to the Fiji government on the, the National Action Plan on Violence Against Women, where 10 years ago, you wouldn't have seen a lesbian led group that was in that space. So I think we keep moving those boundaries over time. Thank you. Thank you, Nolene. Absolutely. I mean, possibilities, there are always, as you said, possibilities occurring and for, for value changes and norm changes. Before I move on, I want to ask if anybody else wants to weigh in here. Yes, please, Melissa, go ahead. Thank you, Bogan. Um, I would just like to add that, again, given, you know, if we're willing to recognize that discrimination does really begin in the family and begin in the private sphere, then I think the the seeds of transformation have to be sown within the family. So the, how we conduct ourselves in the private sphere, what kinds of values we transfer to um, you know, our, our children, for example, or those over whom we have influence, uh, the kinds of conversations, what we hold people for, accountable for, whether we promote equality within the family or not, et cetera. I think we as individuals actually have incredible power to, to make some of the norm changes and attitude changes to set those things into motion in our daily lives within our own private spheres, because the people, for example, you know, the, the people that we influence within our own families or the children that we're raising are also in the public sphere, maybe decision makers, may be, you know, be people who have influence. So I think that mindset and attitude, all of those are shaped in the family. 
And so I think that's where we also really need to begin, recognizing that that's where the root of the problem lies. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Melissa. And before I move in, move on, does anybody else want to jump in here? Okay. Uh, Jade, the next question is specifically for you. Someone wrote, I love how Jade spoke about transformative culture. I would love to hear examples of how Tika has worked with communities to elevate and amplify what is positive and in her words, clarify what needs to change to become more just and inclusive and a stronger democracy. They do this so well and it's so important. Jade, over to you. Thanks for this question. Um, I think just as you have even just mentioned that there are cultures or practices that are positive and I think this is normally our way in. Um, we do use values clarification uh, processes a lot. And this means that when we come into working with a community, we start from what are the community values. And most of the time you will find that communities will hold values of justice or fairness. Um, of course, sometimes when this is explained, it does cut out some people from justice and fairness, but when you shine the light and you show the mirror, communities are very much able to look at this and recognize and start to think of some of the things that they would like to change. So we start from the recognition that there are many positive cultural practices that continue to support and bring justice and equality, and also realize that there are some practices that are, are or have evolved to create some inequality and injustice. So our work with communities is to interrogate those to interrogate the reality and such to bring new ways or renewed light to the positive practices while also finding ways that we can move away and change those that don't serve the community anymore. So this from the ground up approaches and use of values clarification, we have found completely works in addressing especially the root causes and barriers that um, keep women and girls away from services from education from or towards um, early child and forced marriage and sometimes FGM as well. And um, when we work in these ways and just create spaces for community dialogue, create spaces that are not afraid to challenge and question and allow people to learn and, and learn and relearn uh, certain aspects of gender and gender constructs and um, ways that we have understood this uh, constructs for ourselves, we always find that um, these community dialogues always create transformative change. Jade, thank you so much. I, I think it, the way you talk about interrogating reality to bring new light to practices is a, a beautiful illustration. Thank you. Now I am going to go to our next question and let me encourage folks that I know we only have a couple minutes left, but if you still have questions, you can add them into the chat and I'll do my best to uh, cover as much as we can. Uh, Andy, I'd like you to take uh, uh, first answer at this question, but please, I'd like to also open it up to all panelists. And you were talking about the green wave and somebody specifically asked about Columbia's landmark ruling, um, removing barriers uh, to abortion up to 24 weeks of gestation. In particular, what do you think about the number of weeks and the impact this decision can have on the progress towards legalization of abortion in Latin America and beyond? Thank you for such an interesting conversation. Yes, so I think it's a very interesting decision. Um, what I'm more, more concerned about is uh, what comes next, right? Uh, usually we have these this laws, we celebrate, we, we, we are happy about the victories, uh, but then uh, we see a lot of implementation challenges, right? So I'm mostly concerned about implementation and that relates, of course, with what I said before in terms of uh, conscientious objection um, and how that can become a barrier in itself, right? Um, so I'm more, more concerned about uh, the, the challenges that come after passing the law so that we ensure that uh, we have access to these services in practice and not just in, in paper. Absolutely. And let me give a moment in case anybody else would like to weigh in. Okay. 
Uh, Nolene, a specific question came in for you. Uh, somebody asked that they like that you touched on COVID impacts and vaccine and justice. Is it true that women were less likely to get COVID vaccine for fear of the impact on their reproductive system? And the lack of a vaccine in many countries has kept people out of society for the last two years. What are your thoughts? Um, I haven't actually heard that one, um, I would say. Um, there are many, many reasons why um, people are making, you know, deliberate and careful choices around vaccine. Um, there is always, uh, you know, an issue um, in, any, in any state, but particularly in a small island state on the speed with which um, information moves through our community um, in informal um, as much as formal ways. And so I think one of the things I would say is that um, one of the first things we had to very quickly do as civil society but and, as, and with government in partnership with government was be very clear on evidence-based um, information um, that was moving around and trying to make sure that that was in vernacular and trying to make sure that it was um, moving into um, you know, communities of high poverty and um, rural and and um, and marine communities. So I wouldn't really say any more on that, but um, but to say that for for us that was a really big challenge, and that yes, um, vaccine equity is at the heart of you know of all of our questions um, around COVID nineteen, and we still have. Um, communities across the economic south, including in Papua New Guinea, for example, that have very, very low um, vaccine um, uh, equity uh, question, uh, you know, levels in place, um, and that we have to very quickly um, move now to resolve. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nolene. I know it is wild to fit one last question in with three minutes to go, but I'm gonna do it. We're gonna make it happen. Melissa, the last question is for you. The lack of legal protection for body autonomy is obvious as, uh, uh, as Fiona mentioned, um, but what were the practical recommendations at the country level, particularly for countries in the global South? Did the reports generate any suggestions for how to address this? Absolutely. Um, so we have recommendations in a number of different reports because sexual reproductive rights touches upon many spheres of women's lives, like I said earlier. But last year's report in particular makes very concrete recommendations in rela relation to five different areas. And those include eliminating discriminatory laws. So for example, removing criminal bans, uh, prioritizing sexual reproductive health services, which includes, for example, financing them, not just looking at them as an expense, but actually investing money and resources. Then also creating access to justice um, so that um, you know, women can actually seek accountability for violations of their rights. Uh, also building uh, not only main engagement, but allyship. So finding ways to work with men, given that the majority of those in power are male, they are the majority of decision makers. So we do need men as allies and when they fail to make them accountable as well. So that kind of engagement is very important. Uh, also countering uh, a, a, a efforts to roll back rights. So in, in a more direct way. So we have directly asked states. We've also asked the UN system. We've asked agencies within the UN, entities within the UN to use their power and influence to actually push back against attempts to roll back rights. So there are more detailed recommendations in all of these areas, um, but Yes, I mean, one core recommendation I would emphasize, though, is really all governments have to recognize sexual and reproductive health services, including abortion, as essential health care. And then other things will flow from that, including full protection for the right to make decisions about abortion. So the autonomy, as well as access, these have to be uh, fully recognized and supported by government. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you for for fitting in that last answer there. So I would like to thank everyone. We have to wrap up now, but thank you so much for joining us today for this important conversation. Thank you to the Global Justice Center, Fos Feminista, the Permanent Mission of Mexico to the United Nations, the Permanent Mission of Ireland to the United Nations, and the National Institute of Women in Mexico. Thank you to our brilliant panelists and speakers. And thank you to the audience for engaging in the question and answer and being so active in the chat. Uh, this, is the sec this event is a second in a series of conversations about SRHR as a democracy issue. So please keep your eye out for the next event in the series. I look forward to uh, speaking and hearing from all of you and seeing you at the next event.
thank you so much for your time and enjoy CSW.